So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time out of what I'm sure are incredibly busy lives to join this, what we hope will be an exciting, inspiring and informative webinar about local bus, electric bus campaigns in your community. Um, so again, the purpose of this webinar is to inspire, inspire folks to start local electric bus campaigns in their community and and more importantly or as importantly have the knowledge tools um, and understanding of how to move those forward uh, my name is neely kelly and i'm the senior organizer for mothers out front new york and i am based in rochester um, and i'm really i'm thrilled to be here um, i've been learning about electric transit for the past i don't know couple of months and the more i the more I learn about it, the more I recognize how powerful what the opportunity is for us and our communities to push decision makers uh, to decide to go for, for electric buses and not the polluting buses um, that are making our community sick and contributing to climate change. So we have an exciting panel of speakers and presenters this evening. Um, and before we jump in, I just a couple of housekeeping items. So we're going to be using the chat function. If you're on the phone, I will. Um, oh, somebody. Uh, hold on. There we go. Sorry, there was some background noise. Um, so, so there's a chat function. If you have logged in on the computer, if you move your cursor to the bottom of the Zoom screen, you'll see chat. You just click on that. Um, and we will, because this is, we're up to 38 people on the call, we had close to 60 RSVPs. Um, we're gonna be using the chat function instead of trying to, to speak. I think that would be really difficult to manage. Um, there will be a Q&A section. And um, if you are on the phone and you are near a computer or you can send an email, jot down a question, my colleague Lisa Marshall will be monitoring both the chat and checking her email for questions. Um, and her email address is lisa.marshall at mothersoutfront.org. Um, and let's see if you would please stay muted because the background noise can get can can get pretty distracting um and i think before before i introduce uh, michelle romero and move into the green for all piece to this i would love for everyone to go to the chat function. Thank you, Lisa, your, your email, your email is in the chat box now. Um, if folks would just drop a, a note in the chat with your name, where you're from, and one outcome you are hoping to leave this webinar tonight. So just introduce yourselves to the rest of us if you are comfortable. You are not obligated by any stretch, but it's an opportunity for you to introduce yourselves and then for us to, to really understand what, what you're hoping to gain from this webinar. And we'll give this another 30 seconds or so, and then I will, um, Michelle, Fernando, Anna, Michael, Claire is telling someone to be quiet. <laughs> She can hear me. Mm. And another piece of housekeeping, thank you everyone for chiming in. We are recording this webinar, um, not only the audio and the visual, but also the chat. Um, and so we have 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A at the end, and then some um, discussions about next steps. And, and we'll, if we don't get to all the questions, we are going to copy them and, and hopefully get them to you. So people have what they need to get started. Um, okay, so as folks are introducing themselves, thank you so much again. I am, it is my pleasure to introduce Michelle Romero, the National Director for the Green for All, um, uh, for Green for All and an organization that has done an incredible job around electric transit and transitioning our systems um, of dirty diesel to clean to clean buses. And without further ado, Michelle, I'll I'll turn it over to you. 
Thank you, Millie. Hey, everyone. Um, so I'm uh, talking to you out of my home office here in Sacramento, California, and I'm really excited. Um, so I'm Michelle, and I lead Green for All. We're a national program that was founded by Van Jones 10 years ago. Um, and essentially what we do is work to build an inclusive green economy for everyone by uplifting the voice of people of color in the climate movement um, and advocating solutions that bring more work, wealth, and health to uh, communities of color and low-income communities that have been the most impacted by pollution in general. <laughs> um, air, water, soil, you name it. Um, and so I'm really excited to talk with you all um, admittedly, so I feel like I need to share a little bit about my personal story. Um, admittedly, I have not always considered myself an environmentalist, as uh, many people of color, I think, have found themselves um, outside of the mainstream environmental movement or not necessarily seeing a place for themselves in the movement. Um, so when I first came to Green for All, I actually came to help a friend implement her vision uh, while I considered my next professional steps. Um, but within weeks of starting the job, I found myself on the ground in Flint, Michigan. I think she had an agenda and knew that I cared about racial and economic justice. Um, so she sent me to Flint, Michigan, and I was hearing stories of moms who couldn't even bathe their kids in bath water without their skin cracking and bleeding, who were realizing that their kids would never be the same. You know, their behaviors, their attitudes, their whole personalities had changed. Their physical um, bodies had changed from being poisoned with lead. And as a mom, you know, and I had um, a three-year-old at the time who's now four, just feeling like to feel so helpless, right, that you can't do anything. And that's when it really hit for me that these big polluters are polluting our communities and they think that it's okay. And they especially think it's okay because it's just black and brown communities, right? Like that it's um, predominantly being a burden or, or the burden of it is being shouldered largely by low income communities and communities of color who society sees as throwaway in some in some times. So um, it's not okay. And we have the opportunity to do something. So I'm excited that I've stayed at Green for All now and now lead the organization. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to share that uh, we decided to take our to dip our toe into the transportation sector work after having an opportunity to collaborate with the two other organizations that you're going to hear from today. Um, Chispa, who we went and worked with the Chispa chapter in Las Vegas to help kick off a clean buses, a clean school bus campaign that they had um, in 2017 that just really fired us up. Um, and then talking with Holmes Hummel of Clean Energy Works about the tremendous opportunity that we have and that you'll hear about to transition our entire um, bus fleets across the country and really make a huge dent on both climate and health um, and transportation justice and mobility access and so many things um, that we wanted to contribute in a, in a more major way. And so I'll say this, you know, um, the transportation sector is the number one contributor of climate change now in the United States. Um, and that pollution, like most uh, pollution, is concentrated in underserved communities. So where our organization is based in Oakland, California, there are neighborhoods that reek with the constant smell of gasoline, and it's a smell that never goes away. Um, busy freeways and highways on all sides of the neighborhood, coupled with the diesel trucks that idle through their, um, through their streets on their way to the port, overwhelm these communities um, and the very air that they breathe. And so for families who live there, the decision to let their kids play outside comes with a knowing that they'll be exposing their kids to, let's say, the health equivalent of smoking cigarettes all day, um, not something you would typically let your toddler do. Um, but that's what these tailpipes are. They're like cigarettes and the diesel buses that people use just to get to work or to get to school are like refineries on wheels when it comes to um, our health. And so um, we're excited to launch that we are um, launching our fuel change campaign. Um, we're calling it fuel change because we think that all of us as individual actors in this um, and members of the society need to be 
the change. And so we want to fuel the change. Um, and literally, we want to change the fuel. And so um, we aim to mobilize a movement of people across the country to fight climate change and improve health by bringing clean zero emission electric buses to underserved neighborhoods, um, along with other clean transit solutions. Um, and so, you know, the bus piece is important because in the environmental community, when we talk about electrification, there's a lot of emphasis on electric vehicles. So for individual drivers who can get into an EV and how do we, um, you know, get more people into EVs, which is important work. Um, but the public buses and heavier duty freight are actually impacting our communities quite a bit and there needs to be an equal amount of weight given to those issues. And so um, one of our goals is to get local transit agencies to commit to zero emission electric buses. Um, just a bit of context, 60% of transit buses and 95% of school buses are run on diesel, um, which come with a number of serious health impacts, um, high rates of asthma, obviously, cardiovascular disease, impaired lung development, especially in kids, um, preterm and low, weight, low birth weight infants, uh, childhood leukemia, premature death, serious things, right? And so by transitioning um, these heavier duty you know, buses to be clean zero emission buses, we'll be doing a lot to not just tackle the climate issues, but actually improve community health. Um, so yeah, so that's basically what we're trying to do. And we would be thrilled to have you all join us as partners in the cities where you live. And so we're excited about this conversation. Um, I'd be happy to share a little bit more about what we have coming up in our fuel change campaign. But I think first, it would be good to hear next from um, Holmes about uh, sort of the nuts and bolts of what a local campaign like this um, would look like and just sort of how you would get involved in engaging your local transit agency. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, <laughs> I almost started crying when you were talking about the impact um, of these buses. And um, to your point about what your the initiatives you're working on now, I've made a note. And when we get toward around 825, 830 about the next steps, you can have the floor to talk about that um, and potential partnerships and what that could look like and what, what can be done to support your, your efforts. Um, so now I am going to turn it over to Dr. Holmes Hummel um, to talk about the, the financing of electric buses, um, which on the face of it are up to two twi twice as expensive as um, diesel or gas buses. And most systems that are, look, you know, school bus systems, local transit systems really just don't have that kind of cash laying around. Um, so Holmes, take it away. Uh-oh, Holmes, are you muted? Uh, hold on, if you are speaking, um, let... We could see you, can't hear you. Okay. I think I'm, I'm trying to speak. <laughs> I think Holmes is trying to speak, so let me, um, all right, hold on. To un hit the unmute. Uh, okay, uh, you, Holmes, you're unmuted, so I'm not sure. Um, maybe I will. Can you hear me? Now we can hear. Hey, you. I'm unmuted. You are unmuted. So you're 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 communicating through your phone. I was confused. Anyway, you're take it away. We can hear you. You can hear me. Okay. Hi, friends. I'm really feeling privileged to join a call with this number of participants and with the leadership that we have here. I was having dinner last night with a cousin of mine who told me as a mother that her kids in 2050 will be younger than she is now. And that just made it hit home for me that we're not going to leave these problems to be inherited by a next generation, but we really own them today. And I'm proud to be supporting all of the organizers that have called in from the post that I hold at Clean Energy Works. It's a nonprofit organization founded after a period of service at the Department of Energy where I was serving as the senior policy advisor during the Recovery Act era. And during that time, we put a lot of money into new clean energy technologies, 
but not everybody benefited. And questions about economic inclusion lingered for a long time, damaging the prospects of participation and therefore expansion of the constituency that could support a climate action uh, platform. So the leadership at Green for All and CHISPA has been really important for Clean Energy Works in terms of setting our own priorities of how we're devoting attention to an aspect of a problem that affects both transportation and energy efficiency and clean energy in our local communities. And that has to do with accessing capital and money at scale to get the solutions that we need. So Michelle just introduced me as a person who works on problems with our Clean Energy Works team to remove barriers to success for local campaigners that know that their demands are in line with what our political environment and our science urgently calls for, but they're running into barriers from decision makers who say, that's a really great idea, but do you have any idea how much that costs and where do you think we're possibly gonna get the money for that? So we've learned a lot from bus transit campaigners that are winning in the United States. And they're starting out by demanding, first of all, targets from people who know that we cannot tolerate a future that continues to accumulate fossil fuel assets in our local infrastructure. After winning from decision makers agreement that this is just not acceptable, everyone needs to take a first step forward. And so winning the victory of getting that first clean transit bus into the community is a victory that every chapter on this call will eventually be able to claim. The question is, how soon? So we tried to accelerate the pace at which you can claim that first victory by sharing success stories from other places and connecting you with resources that will help your own decision makers get to yes. But even after getting that first bus or first few buses, we still need to be able to visualize what it means to go from the science fair scale experiment of clean energy buses in our community to never buying another diesel bus again. And that means buying all electric and celebrating the first year where the school district or the transit district is able to buy every bus that they buy new clean. Even after that point, believe it or not, it can take the distance of time between a child in kindergarten and their graduation year to get the last diesel bus out of the fleet. No joke, 12 years. That adds to the urgency of getting started now because every year we delay is another year in the future that we're still driving around our communities with these polluting vehicles that we know better could be replaced today. One of the challenges though, is that the school buses that are running on electricity and can run with zero emission electricity grid uh, power if supplied that way, they really cost a lot more. They cost like triple the cost of a diesel bus today, though that difference is going down. The good news is, though, that they do cost less to operate over time, so they do save money over time. So the big trick is to figure out how to get through that first cost barrier and to assure a school board member that's concerned about allocating money between teacher pay and textbooks and transportation, that it's possible for us to make improvements in all three without sacrifice. And that's important also to avoiding the wedges that opponents will want to drive between people who are campaigning for both better education and for a better environment. What we do at Clean Energy Works is draw in the utilities because they are actually good allies on a campaign for clean transit. But some people might have experience actually facing off with their local utilities, demanding more for their utilities than the utilities are able to give today on things like greening the grid or accelerating their smart grid investments. Clean Energy Works helps equip you with a good news narrative that you can bring to decision makers, not just in your school board or your local transportation department, but how they can go with you as compelling messengers to the utility to give the utility a good news message about their part in a future that runs on 100% clean electricity for 100% clean transit. I don't think that I want to delve into the weeds or the details of how the utilities investment in the onboard batteries and charging stations can help knock down that first cost barrier. 
but leave it to the Q&A and perhaps a subsequent call for people who want to go to those nuts and bolts for how those transaction paths will work. But I want to assure you as I transition our call to the women and leaders at CHISPA that I'm calling you today from a visit to Sacramento, a, a capital a city and a state that has abundant resources for a clean energy economy. And I want you to know that this year, there's Clean School Bus Fund is oversubscribed by 500%. They're half a billion dollars short on the money that would be required to fill the demand from all the disadvantaged communities that filed paperwork this year saying they wanted their clean electric buses. We're basically kicking a thousand electric buses down the road. They won't be bought this year. So this is the challenge to invite and encourage all of the mothers in all of the communities who know that there are pathways to getting the answers we need if we bring in the allies from all of the aligned interests, including the electric power sector, that can help overcome the first cost barriers that are currently keeping us from our goals. Michelle, I hope I've served your purposes in supporting the call from Green for All for more action on this front. And I'm very honored by the invitation to support all of the mothers organized by mothers out front and the allies at CHISPA who can help build the call to action. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. And I'm just so relieved it's all being recorded. So I don't have to take notes. Um, so I'm going to turn it over now to Fernando um, Cazares, uh, the National Director for CHISPA. Um, and Fernando, just so you know, we're, we're a few minutes behind, but I want you all to take the time that you need because we are all really looking forward to hearing the story um, of HIPAA and the Clean Buses for Healthy Niños campaign. So um, take it away. Great, can, can folks hear me? Great. Uh, so I'm Fernando, I'm um, based in Washington, D.C. And just to piggyback on, on Michelle's point, um, I have two nieces, uh, they're now 13 and 11. They live in Bakersfield, California, which is one of the most polluted uh, counties in Kern County in California. So. Uh, the work for me is also personal, and for many of you, it's also personal. And you'll hear later today from one of our uh, Chispa uh, mothers who's organizing for personal reasons as well. So as was said, um, just want to give you a little bit of what Chispa is. So Chispa basically means spark, spark in Spanish. So our vision is that organizing uh, in the six states and where we're located is uh, going to a movement of Latinos and other communities of color, um, typically uh, talked about as a frontline communities of climate change. Uh, we are based in Nevada, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, Connecticut, and Maryland. So six states currently, and we're looking at expanding to two more states this year. We are the uh, grassroots organizing program of the legal conservation voters. Um, so within that, uh, our model is one in which the voices of Latinos and other communities of color through grassroots organizing, power building, uh, and accountability um, are going to be uh, seen and heard by elected officials and also polluters in their own communities. Um, so we do typical community organizing with a campaign structure. Um, so our communities have organized around clean energy, renewable portfolio standards, access to the outdoors. Um, and now you know, for the last two year and a half since uh, 2017, uh, we have been organizing around six states around the, what we call the clean buses, clean buses for healthy niños campaign. Uh, so when we were looking uh, in 2017, we were asking ourselves how we can generate a campaign that can get us all working together across our six states um, that can really build uh, the grassroots capacity and grassroots maturity uh, of our organizers and our, and our promotoras uh, in a clear demand with a clear uh, timeline, with a clear target. And it's something that was also personal to them. Um, one of the th uh, points that I'll mention is that uh, there are 25 million children who are uh, you know, transported every day uh, to their school by a school bus that's larger than any, they're the single largest transit uh, ridership in the country. Um, and school buses um, comprise, there's more, there are about 480,000 school buses. So that's w significantly larger than mass transit. Um, so for the last year and a half, we've been organizing, we made demands of the governors, uh, our organizers, collected uh, petitions and pledges, both paper pledges and online pledges. We also used uh, digital organizing so people were able to text their demand to their governors. Um, 
and we're, we're also, also able to do traditional um, you know, rallies and traditional lobby days in the capitals. Um, but don't take it from me. What I would like to do now is uh, pass the microphone over to Ms. Berta Robledo, who's one of our lead promotoras in, in Las Vegas, Nevada. So, Catherine. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, my name is Berta Robledo. I am waiter. I have four sons and four grandchildren. I live in Vegas from 1985. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> ¿Cómo se Yo soy promotora de Chispa Nevada. Uh, sí, usted comienza y yo le traduzco. Ok. okay. ¿Sí? Pero sí. eso me dijiste que me que mm -hmm. hiciera pausa. Yo soy promotora de Chispa Nevada. Fui a la primera graduación de promotores y me gustó lo que hacen. Y por eso me involucré en esto. So, um, I'm a promoter, which is uh, what we call our volunteers who've gone through a leadership training. Um, after five or more shifts, they're able to do this long leadership training that's super intense, but they learn about civics. Um, so, she got to do the training class. Um, and after watching the graduation ceremony of the first class that graduated at Chispa, uh, she learned that she really liked what Chispa did, and that's why she got involved. Yo he trabajado en recoger firmas para que el gobernador de Nevada cambie los autobuses escolares de los niños, porque hay muchos niños enfermos de asma. Los autobuses hoy en día son de diesel y nosotros estamos trabajando para que los cambien a eléctricos. El estado de Nevada tiene 25 millones que le ganó a la Volkswagen, Volkswagen de una demanda. Um, so I helped collect 4,000 signatures that were turned into uh, the governor of Nevada. Um, we want to change the school buses from diesel to zero emission electric using the funds off the Volkswagen um, mitigation settlement, uh, and the state of Nevada is going to be receiving $25 million. ¿Sí? Nosotros hemos levantado 4,000 firmas. Para, y se las llevamos a las oficinas del gobernador. Y hemos trabajado tocando puertas para levantar firmas para que nosotros Ay, no se me olvidó. Um, okay. um, so we helped to collect the 4,000 signatures and we went directly to the governor's office to go turn it in. Yeah. A lot of the ways that we go to collect signatures is we go to uh, door knocking. Uh, so we go door to door and let, letting our community members know about the Clean Buses Healthy Meals campaign. Um, and we also go to tabling events where we talk to our community. So everywhere that we can uh, share uh, the information on the Clean Buses for Healthy Meals campaign, um, that's the way that we start collecting signatures so we can let our governor know that this is something that we support. You did? Okay, and that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was amazing. Um, some really impressive organizing uh, leadership and tactics in that story um, of the clean buses for healthy niños. Thank you so much for sharing um, and for translating. Um, so I will now turn it over to Jennifer Rogers Brown, a Mothers Out Front leader on Long Island, who is whose team is 
beginning um, to launch a local electric school bus campaign. Um, Jennifer, the floor is yours. Hi. <laughs> Um, thank you, everybody. That was wonderful to hear these stories. Um, oh, I'm, I'm on Long Island, and um, my group, we live really in Huntington, Long Island. We have five active core members. Um, we had some success last year in our town of Huntington. Uh, we've been pushing them to move towards a commitment for 100% renewable energy for our town. Um, we ended up kind of moving them um, towards settling on a climate smart communities commitment for now. Um, and now we've uh, begun this campaign around um, transitioning our school bus fleet to electric vehicles. And we've been very much in the research phase and investigating how we're gonna handle this because we have eight school districts in our town. Um, we, and each of our core members live in different districts. So we've chosen one district of South Huntington and our goal is to get the district to commit to transition its fleet to electric vehicle as each as they retire each vehicle. So as Holmes said, you know, getting that first one done, you know, to get that first vehicle um, transitioned is what our first goal is. And um, our, we will start with the focus on getting that commitment for the one bus transition after the first one is retired. Um, we hosted a small house party that included Seki and Sarah Smiles, who you're here from next, plus leaders of a South Huntington Girl Scouts group. So we're investigating different ways we could build some capacity around this. And I'm going to turn it over to Billy, who's also in our group, to talk, uh, just mention a couple key things that we found and to leave you with a couple questions that we hope um, you can help us with. Um, hi. We're still in research mode, but we discovered a number of interesting things. First of all, in our school districts, they don't exclusively own uh, the buses. In other words, they own the buses, but they, don't, they supplement their bus use with outside bus companies that are private. Um, so we may have two places to go to convince people to go electric. Um, uh, we also f I also found that an electric bus company is coming here with with an electric bus on March or April um, so hopefully we'll get a lot of people in to see this demonstration it's really exciting um, and uh, we have a vi last year another company came and we didn't know at all about it and we've posted the video of the meeting on our Facebook page so anyone can take a look at it um, I think our biggest thing is um, the range limitation and uh, the financing. So that's the pieces we really need to know about. Thanks. That was excellent. Thank you, uh, Jennifer and Billy. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Sarah Smiley, who lives in the Lower Hudson Valley and is, again, working with a team, try, working to launch a, an electric school bus campaign. Sarah? Hi, thanks, Neely. Um, so my team represents a few different villages along the Hudson River, just north of New York City. And we have uh, six school districts, five of which are under one transportation department. So my teammate, Bonnie Mazza, uh, organized a meeting yesterday with the director of transportation for those five districts. And uh, our teammate, Katie Himes, and I both attended with her as part of our fact-finding um, portion of uh, research gathering. And um, it was really interesting. It, he was very positive about electric school buses. Um, we have a very receptive community, I think, to sustainability initiatives. And he also pointed out that he wants to be innovative and he wants to be the first to do these things. Um, and we also live close to White Plains, which has a pilot program that they're doing with the utility company, um, uh, where they have five electric school buses. So we're able to point to that as a reference for our districts. Um, and it really came down to, for uh, the person we met with yesterday, what the, the bottom line is. So he wants to know how it's cost effective um, over the lifespan of the bus. And, um, so we were encouraged because we feel like if we can bring back case studies, which we're hoping to gather through this process, um, to show that it would be cost effective. And if we can bring back a financing mechanism that the school district can leverage, we think that will be a great opportunity. Um, he did push it back to us. He, he was kept pointing to, well, you should talk to state legislators to get more money for the district. Um, so we're, we think that might be a, 
a slight hurdle to overcome, but we think if uh, we come armed with some really positive stories and information, we'll have a, a lot of people who'd be really receptive to it. And our next step is um, I'm going to reach out to the superintendent of the other school district in our, in our team and uh, see if we can get a meeting there as well. So really excited to move forward. Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. Um, okay, so there are a lot of there are a lot of questions in the chat and a lot are um, pretty technical and with um, factoids and fleet um, fleet managers and things like that. And so what we're going to do instead of instead of focusing on those for this large of a call because that information is available, but but what is important on this call and I think will be incredibly valuable is really starting to talk about the strategy of developing a winnable campaign. The nuts and bolts, the questions, again, we're saving the chat and we're saving, um, we're recording this call. Um, so the nuts and bolts will circulate the answers to those questions. Tomorrow might be a little ambitious, early next week. Um, but to, to really dig in a little on the strategy of developing a winnable local campaign. Um, so does anyone have any questions about that? Please do put it in the chat. Or um, Holmes, I was gonna ask if you would like to, if you would like to jump in and sort of give a, get us started. Neely, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, first of all, thanks to each and every one of the speakers. Um, that was really remarkable. Um, I wanted to say a couple of words about strategy uh, and in response to some of the things on the chat. First of all, all of the people I've heard from have done one of the most difficult things, which is to find out who's in charge. And that is like step one. It's like, Find out who's in charge around here. And you might be amazed to learn who the transportation director is in your community. A lot of times they are people who themselves are struggling to be empowered inside their own organization. In rural areas, they may be physical education teachers that are also part-time responsible for the school bus fleet. You will find allies in the transportation directors. You might also find that when you reach people who have control over the budgets for those transportation directors, they are eager to send you to their decision makers and have you carry water for them to those places. But here's where I want to caution, because I'm not sure that doing what we've always done will get us where we need to go. And in particular, when we're talking about transitioning the entire energy economy, treating it as if it's some sort of grants program is not on the scale of what we're talking about. Sure, we can always use grants money, but actually the amount of money, amount of time that we spend trying to win grant money will guarantee that we only end up with a toothpick that we need, not real two by fours. So here is where you can harness the interest of those decision makers to go with you to the places where large amounts of money are decided every day in the actual investment streams that are paying for the equipment that are trolling around the neighborhoods that you have. So there is a yes and here. And for the campaigners that we've already heard on this call, who were challenged by the decision makers they found to bring back the answer themselves, that is a sure sign that Clean Energy Works and the allies on this call are ready to help you move through that conversation and not accept it as your burden. You're not volunteer material for professional services to do these types of things. Those are questions that go to the kind of specialists that they need to be working with and we can help you move back around that conversation. So Clean Energy Works, we actually produce cost effectiveness analysis for electric bus fleets for transit fleets and for school bus fleets. And we do that with real industry consultants that can stack up the costs and the savings and show that we're better off moving now and not waiting till later. So those are the types of things that come in the campaign planning where 
you can lay out your milestones and then draw in where you need certain key pieces of information in order to break through the barriers. I know there's lots of Q&A in the chat, and I pledge that Clean Energy Works will make as many contributions as we can to the draft responses that will be circulated after the call. Thank you, Holmes. I just, I am learning more and more every 15 seconds. So um, does anyone have anything they'd like to ask, I guess, relevant to what Holmes just laid out? <clears throat> you can put it in the chat. I think, well, so the, the chat's a little quiet right now, um, but one question that occurred to me, um, Holmes, as you were talking about the kind of a, a cost-effective analysis um, that you all can provide, when, you know, in terms of how does that work, how would that, maybe this is nuts and bolts question, but I'll go ahead and ask it anyway. Um, with groups on the ground, right, say we're working with a, a school district um, in the Hudson Valley, and they need this cost-effective analysis. Like, does Clean Energy Works have the kind of capacity to, to respond to that? Um, is there a cost for it? Sort of what does that look like? Neely, can you still hear me? Yes. Good. I had to cut off this video, but I want you to know that Clean Energy Works currently can produce the cost-effectiveness analysis with the utility industry analyst partners that we have cultivated. These are graduates from the MIT Transit Lab that help us crunch the numbers. And it is not free for us. We have to raise and spend uh, on the order of $10,000 for each utility service area that we work with. And for me, that's a lot of money for us to raise and spend for if you think about every different utility district in the country where this needs to occur. So we're doing two things about that. One is we're challenging the people to go first that we can cost share. and in the first cases, we are able to pay for everything. But as we move on, we're asking for the cost share because these are multi-million dollar investments. So what we're trying to do is move a multi-million dollar grant need to a multi-million dollar investment plan. One that allows the school district or the city to move forward without waiting for somebody to come through with a government spending program because we need business as usual to become clean transit as usual. So Clean Energy Works can work with the early adopters and sponsor some of these financial analysis. And as we get loaded up and piled on and we're oversubscribed, we can work out the cost sharing arrangements. But the savings to any school district or transit district are enormous. When you think about the situation where everyone's spending lots of money trying to write grants to get their next battery versus being able to move ahead with their utility at full speed. Okay, I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I was sort of processing that. Um, so I guess to understand you clearly, you're asking the school districts to cost share because of the savings down the road from an electric transit fleet. Is that, is that right? I think you might- uh, nearly no, Neely, we do not need a school district to be the sponsor. We need any source of funding. And in, in an offline conversation, any group of campaigners here want to go in with us together, we would like to go to some of the biggest funders in this country and say, don't make us go and look for this money, one little school district at a time. Give us a pot of money that we can do 10, 20, 30 analyses so that there's infrastructure and a network of campaigners for clean school buses all across the country can work together to pre present the evidence to their decision makers. What we do need from a transportation director at a school district is cooperation. Cooperation is even better than cash in a lot of cases. And some of the key things that we need in terms of cooperation include basic information, just the data. How many school buses? How far do they go? How much diesel fuel do they buy every single year already? And for those on the call today who've highlighted the kinds of concerns that a very earnest transportation director 
can put up. Like, gosh, I don't think that technology is fit for my fleet because I've heard that those buses don't go far enough. We need their cooperation to be curious. Well, what are the bus route links? And by the way, they're going to vary. Some of them will be as short as 40 miles. Some of them might be 140 miles. So we can get into a conversation with that transportation director and say, look, we're not going to try to electrify your longest routes first, but we're not gonna wait to take the diesel out of the shortest ones. Let's get started. So we need both cash and cooperation. We can work with you with cash from any sort, but cooperation and good rapport and diplomacy, that's where the campaigner's genius, right where you are and the relationships that you have are incredibly valuable. The kind of thing money can't buy. That, um, yeah, that's really helpful. Like that, those two pieces of information, like I guess what sort of the expertise that Clean Energy Works is bringing to the call and then what is really needed from people on the ground rooted in those communities, um, first and foremost. Um, so let's see, there, I don't know, Holmes, if you're looking at the chat, um, uh, let's see, I'm scrolling through the questions quickly. Um, Jennifer asks, at what point in the campaign do we approach the bus company and utilities to get them on board? Um, or do we leave it entirely to the school district to make the commitment and demand the change? Well, two things. Uh, the school district and the kids who ride those buses are the ones to make the demands, really. I mean, it's the, the parents and the children who have such a voice of authority. And here I cede quickly to Green for All and Chispa. These are the leaders who have been leading the way. But with that win, the first win being just the demand, you're inevitably going to find that people will say, that is a really expensive demand. And that is where a conversation about financing helps us pole vault over that barrier and move past that blockade. And Clean Energy Works is a source of technical assistance and allied support to help the campaigners where you are answer those questions and find the allies to bring them to the conversation where the amount of money that you need can be invested with and through your utility, not just taking money from textbooks and teachers. So can you hear me? Yes. So I was going to ask, uh, I was going to say one of the strategies that our, our six states are going to be implementing is uh, to Holmes point is to demand that their school district, their school boards adopt resolutions and policies that will transition their, all their diesel buses. And this is something that we're also you know, coming up with, whether is it a, is it a 10 year period? Is it a 15 year period? So uh, our job as, as you know, grassroots organizers, as advocate, is to create the political momentum and the political de demand uh, for this thing to happen. We, we, don't not, we don't need to be the experts, the financial experts, the technical experts. That's what these folks get paid for. That's what their school board members are for. Um, so if there's nobody demanding it, if there's no policy behind it, we could, we're always going to be you know, styled by these qu technical questions, which are legitimate, but they're not necessarily ours to answer. We're here to you know, make the case why this is the right thing, and we're here to uh, create the political momentum through parents and other political you know, forces to get them to adopt this po uh, policy. So um, you know, there, are, there is precedent where you know, large transit agencies like uh, LA, the Metro and the city of LA already committed to go all electric by 2025. So that was not because the Metro board decided it was the right thing to do. It was because there was a coalition of advocates from the experts, from grassroots, from environmental justice who showed up to the board and made their demand. And there are experts behind those agencies that it's their job to figure it out. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. And that's where I think Green for All can be really helpful too, is on building that broad public support and 
the political pressure, if you will, so that when you and whoever you take with you to the agency meetings are showing up and asking for these things, they know they're already dealing with the issue in the press um, and that there's sort of this mounting momentum. And that's, that's really where Green for All's strength is. Um, you know, just to give you an example, in August, I guess it was 2017 already, my gosh, um, but we worked with the Las Vegas, um, for, with Chispa Nevada in Las Vegas to kick off the Clean Buses campaign there, um, trying to get Volkswagen money initially for school buses. And we were able to, by bringing our video services and working with our media partners at Now This, take that kickoff campaign that they were already organizing and bringing people to um, and capture the right content with the right messengers. We did have Van go. And so we got like, you know, <laughs> helped with the pitch, not going to lie. Um, <laughs> but we were able to get now this to do a video on it where we saw 1.5 million views in the first five days that that video went out. And so, um, to the extent that there are ways that we can bring greater visibility to what you are doing um, and help, you know, propel the campaign through our media and communications work, um, that's something that we certainly can offer. And then the other piece that I wanted to say was I saw in the chat, um, Patrick said, uh, imagine the first, you know, the kids that get to ride the first electric bus in their, at their school or whatever. He said, bragging rights for life. And I, and I thought to myself, yeah, if they saw it that way, right? Like, how do we make riding electric buses a cool thing and for everyone that they resonate? So I think, you know, today, like for me, I, I drive where I live is, uh, you know, you have to have a car. Um, and, but when I get in the car, there's a sense that, you know, traffic accidents are a risk. You know, that if there's an accident, it's going to affect your commute time. There's like, you see them on the side of the road. There's like some sense that that's a safety concern when you get on the road. Um, there's not the same like level of urgency around transportation pollution, that that is an actual like health and safety risk. And that when we're having our kids just stand outside waiting for the school bus, that we should actually like feel some type of way about that. And so I think that's what um, we see our work as being through our content and communications campaigns to make that shift. So there, we're raising the consciousness of, um, of parents, of communities who are impacted, of young people, that there's something um, wrong about this picture because we have a better way to do it. And to ask for that better way, that we deserve that cleaner, greener solution. So um, just, you know, to circle back a little bit about what we have coming up, um, one thing Green for All is working on right now is a music video uh, for the Fuel Change campaign. And the idea is exactly that, to um, communicate the public health impacts of transportation pollution um, and the need to go electric and transition our transportation sector, um, but in a cool, fun <laughs> way. I promise it won't be cheesy. Um, it will not be cheesy. And actually, I'll drop a link to uh, one of the artists or two of the artists, if I can grab the links quickly, um, that we've selected for this thing. We had a competition um, in December and January, where we put out a call to rappers and hip hop artists and singer songwriters, spoken word poets, you know, to learn about the transportation issues. Some attended a lyric writing workshop um, and then basically submit a verse for a chance to be featured. And so we have some um, amazing artists who all come from directly impacted communities. Um, young people, one guy just graduated from high school and um, you know, has a personal story about how asthma is affecting him in Oakland. And so um, that will be another sort of educational tool, but also experience to the extent we can do live events and things like that, that bring a more diverse constituency to this work. Um, that's amazing. And as I, you know, to, to sort of sum up what I've heard from what you just said, Michelle, and, and Holmes, what you were saying, and Fernando, um, what you've been adding to is like, and, and what Mothers Out Front, quite frankly, says all the time about climate change, like we need the political will. And what we have, like, I feel like we're 
sitting on a gold mine and I, for lack of a better analogy, my, you know, it's eight thirty at night for, for me. So I'm a, a little, a little fuzzy, but in terms of a gold mine of mothers, grandmothers and allies who can be that voice pushing decision makers. And when the decision makers say, um, Oh, but, Oh, but we, we are sitting, you know, with Green for All and the work of Clean Energy Works, we can access those answers. And so I think, so it's 828 and we're supposed to go until 845, but, but I'm thinking now might be a really good shift to hear Michelle from you, Fernando from you, um, Berta and um, Catherine as well. You know, what, what do you see as next steps that, could move this forward. Um, well, I have ideas, so I guess I'll jump in. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mentioned this music video that we're working on, and so we're working to launch that in uh, March and want to organize some watch parties around it to bring more folks into this work. Um, the first step is raising, you know, like awareness of this and teaching other people about the issue so that we can cultivate advocates um, for these local campaigns. And so that's the first thing. We're hosting a series of webinars about the rollout strategy for that. And we'll host um, a training for anyone who signs up to host a watch party. So anyone on this call who wants to host a watch party in your area, um, that would be phenomenal. And then we can send folks from our list in those areas too to your watch party. Um, and so that's one simple way to help um, both recruit for a local campaign if you are interested in working on these issues um, while also getting more information. Um, the other thing is, hang on, let me go back to my notes. I know there were a few. So we're gonna work on a get, getting started guide. Um, so for those who haven't engaged on uh, bus, elect bus electrification issues uh, in the past to have some guidance around how to get started, including an FAQ uh, that would answer some of these questions that continuously come up around the cost, around range, around you know, the maintenance, and like just the things that we can help um, to answer so that folks don't feel like they showed up and now the agency just bombarded them with a bunch of questions they didn't expect, right? And so some of that. So for those of you who are really interested in that, um, it'd be helpful and valuable to have a few set of eyes on those so we get some feedback from those of you who would use a toolkit like this so before we deploy it <laughs> more broadly. Um, for anyone who's just loves to geek out and wants to dive more into research and you have a little bit of a time and want to take a chunk, um, for example, going deeper on range or going deeper on the question of what if you're um, district is contracting with a private company and so you know some solutions around that or even pulling together some case studies i think that there are ways that we can co-create this resource um and we're happy to just sort of serve as a project coordinator if you will to make sure that it all rolls into one thing and that the sum of the parts are um better than the whole whatever you guys know what i'm talking about <laughs> um so that, and then the other thing that is helpful for like the communication side of it is gathering stories of impact. Um, and we do have a great platform that we've developed that is, that you can find at myclimatecost, let me write this into the chat, myclimatecost.org. And it's a story share platform where people can record a story in video format, like from their computer or from their cell phone, they can upload something that they've already done or they can write in their story. Um, and so we regularly collect these on the impacts of climate pollution, but we wanna start sourcing more of these from transportation as a source of climate pollution um, to be able to do all sorts of other content and help like with this narrative change work. So um, that's another thing. But I think the most important is like figuring out a way for us to have a regular a feedback loop so that we can learn from the work that you're doing on the ground um, and stay coordinated to identify like where we can bring our collective resources together to help get more of these campaigns over the finish line and, and see more wins. 
So it looks like you've got at least three watch parties. Um, that three three commitments to watch watch Yay! parties. Yay! Oh, just saw the chat. <laughs> um, in Atlanta, in Rochester, and Boston. Um, well, JP, J Jamaica Plain. Um, so anyone else want to want to throw a watch party and put it in the chat? Um, uh, I was I was gonna I was gonna ask uh, Catherine. Uh, she and Berta want to share um, what they're planning to do in Las Vegas in uh, this year to push the campaign and I'll share something else. Yeah. Berta, ¿tiene algo que quiera agregar? Bueno, uh, yo, qui yo quisiera invitar a todos los padres de Las Vegas, Nevada para que le hablen al nuevo gobernador para que nos uh, eh, para que él nos cambie los autobuses ellos los padres de los niños tienen mucho derecho uh -huh. a hablarle al gobernador para que okay. para que nos cambie los autobuses porque hay muchos niños enfermos de la de asma okay. um, so what she thinks is now that Nevada has a new governor is making sure that the parents are calling our new governor to make sure that he's informed about the campaign and that he supports it fully to make sure that um, parents with kids with asthma are sharing their stories. So um, it motivates him to make a change towards our campaign. Um, and I guess one of the things that like I was really thinking about with the Clean Buses campaign that we're doing um, is making sure that we're really, when we collect the stories, that we're really promoting it. We have a lot of people that we talk to day to day that are affected, and then you only have a couple of stories that you hear. So it's making sure that people's voices are being heard because this is, it's not just about changing the school bus, it affects people. Um, so you need to put a face every single time it's a new face, it's a new story, so that more people can connect to it. Mm -hmm. The only thing we'll add is that uh, a couple of our goals this year are to engage the mass media, um, you know, in the state, in the states where we are doing the campaigns, but also the big uh, national outlets. You know, what we've seen on the last couple of articles, uh, the folks who get highlighted are the school district, uh, the manufacturer, a local city, local or federal, you know, representative who's making a pilot happen. But there is no story about the, the children. There isn't a story about the parents or the communities uh, that live along the route or the communities that live along the uh, school bus yards. So the real the, the impact of what all this diesel emission is, ha is having on communities is definitely not part of the picture. So we're planning to engage our, our communications uh, resources uh, so that the next uh, articles that come out at the national or regional level have a an impact of uh, both the communities that are suffering, but also the the mothers and the and the youth that are actually organizing to make this happen uh, in the six states that we're in, but also other states. Um, we're looking to work with Clean Energy Works to advance the conversation with school districts and utilities in the six states that we're located. Uh, we are also working with New York, Michigan, uh, and New, New Jersey um, to explore the opportunity to leverage the Volkswagen sediment into larger uh, fleet-wide opportunities rather than just one pilot at a time. So. Hopefully this year we'll have uh, a proof of concept uh, around this public utility school district uh, agreement. And um, I, mean, I would also say use you know letters to the editor. Um, one thing about, I used to work for an elected, so I always tell people that one of the things that electeds like, uh, like uh, celebrities in Hollywood always care about is their image. And they look at their image based on uh, whether or not they get coverage on the national on television or uh, news articles, and now with the uh, rise of social media, they're they're tracking their social media. So always think of yourself as somebody who can directly um, make your elected look good or look bad, or put them on the spot and just say why are you not you know why are you not advocating for clean electric school buses? Why are you letting our children be polluted with diesel school buses and um, so just think of yourself as an advocate, you know, one one step at a time, a letter to the editor, a tweet, go to your school board and, and ask those questions. Um, that's incredibly important. Thank you so much for that. Um, 
Fernando. There was a there's a question in the chat that ties into what what you were saying and and um, what what Catherine and Berta were talking about in terms of stories. And I'd love to hear um, Michelle, Catherine, Berta, Fernando, in regards to do kids and parents easily make the connection between their health and the buses? Um, do they do they know? Do they do they they might smell bad or may see the diesel fumes? But is there it, is there that connection made that is easy to, for lack of a better word, capitalize on and, and use to, to bring folks in to advocate and push these campaigns and policies forward? I'm hoping that Catherine and Berta will answer that. If they don't, I can jump in. I'll just share that, you know, several of our promotores, you know, end up becoming our organizers in the States. So we have a story of an organizer in Connecticut. He was a community leader and can talk about his experience riding a school bus and why he just chose to take action around it. In Arizona, our organizers are also coming from the community and our leaders are coming from the community. So they're, they can make the connection about their children's asthma rates or their community's respiratory illnesses. Um, and they can also, this is an interesting one, they're also looking around uh, related land use issues and they're also asking themselves a question about why aren't, there, why aren't there enough trees and greenery in our communities to at least buffer us from the emissions or extreme heat. Um, and they can also, they're also starting to question about you know, where these school uh, school uh, yards, the par parking lots for the school buses, why are they located in you know low income communities of color in their neighborhood? So, um, I'm not you know I'm not a parent, but uh, uh, Catherine and, and Berta, do you guys uh, want to answer that question too? So Berta's running out of the room right now, um, but one of the things that usually the like the teenage kids will realize it because they go to their doctor's visits and the doctors will be like, what are you exposed to? But when it comes to like the younger kids, uh, the parents will be like, I don't know, this is what we do, this is what his life is like. And then the doctors will be like, oh, you know, maybe the buses. Um, so that's one of the things that we see is parents are starting to associate it when they talk to their doctors and the doctors let them know. So they're like, you know what? I can't drive my kid to school. I can't walk them to school. It's too far. So unfortunately, my kid is going to have to keep driving this or riding this bus that's going to continue making them sick. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. When you talk to kids who are directly impacted, um, a little bit of information goes a long way. So when we had the chance to go to Las Vegas, we met with a 13-year-old who, um, you know, talked about how when he would go out to the PE yard that he would often get triggered and have an asthma attack or that when the school bus came and he didn't, you know, make the connection necessarily to the power plant without someone saying that, hey, the power plants have X effect, right? But he can see the power plant from the schoolyard where they play. And so that made sense to him, right? That he knows he goes outside in this um, health event regularly occurs, but you may not have understood why and that the proximity to that power plant likely has an effect. Um, but when you make that connection, then it, you know, it like, it makes sense. It's a light bulb moment. We had the similar experiences when we hosted our lyric writing workshop in Oakland. There were people who, um, in some part, because there was a financial incentive, right, for the winners of the contest and whoever we feature to pay them for their work um, showed up and not necessarily because they understood all about the environmental issue. Um, but when they came, because they're from Oakland and are highly impacted by transportation pollution, um, simple, you know, things that we would share about tailpipe pollution, what comes out of those tailpipes, and also just like the visuals, right, of um, people, you know, Mike actually from our, our organizing director shared this example and it resonated with a lot of people in the room, which was that when you wear a white tee outside in some of these communities, by the end of the day, it looks a little tinged. <laughs> um, that is because of the pollution, you know, and so um, 
So those things make it real because they can see it. They may not have ever understood it. Like it's just a thing, right? It's just normal, unfortunately. Um, but when you make the connection, it really is a light bulb moment. And everyone in the room realized like, oh, wow, almost all of them had asthma. Um, and almost all of them, you know, like had some experience like that. They were like, oh, yeah, my T-shirt does it all the time. Or, yeah, I noticed, you know, the outside of our house gets dirty. So, you know, um, things like that. So that's really, um, really eye opening and, and helpful, I think. And, and what's so important and the, the, the power I see in this campaign and these, you know, national, local levels is being able to um, offer people a path to fix it, right? That is doable and achievable. Um, and so I am, it, we are close to finishing. Um, and I would love to take the last couple of minutes to give everyone an opportunity to share in the chat um, one word describing how you felt this call, how you're feeling in regards to this call, um, what your experience was, and also what is a concrete next step um, you plan to take. I think we have, we're up to like eight or nine or 10 watch parties um, across the country. And so um, if folks will just take the last minute or two and, and, a, um, and I'm gonna participate as well because I have some next steps for, for me in my head. Um, and I just wanna take the opportunity to thank everyone for joining. Um, Michelle, Holmes, Catherine, Berta, um, Fernando, thank you all so much. This has been incredibly powerful. Um, would she like to say something, Catherine? Yeah, she, okay. she wants to say something. Okay. Uh, Cuando yo voy a levantar firmas, me pregunta que por qué estoy haciendo eso. Entonces yo les digo porque hay niños enfermos de asma y me dicen, yo no tengo niños, yo no soy casada. Ah, ah, espérese, mi hermana tiene un niño enfermo de asma y viaja en el autobús escolar y me han dicho, me ha dicho mi hermana que se ha puesto más enfermo. Pero esa... Una pausa. Déjame les, les digo. So, um, she says when she goes to tabling events and she asks people to fill out like the little petition sheet, um, they'll ask like what it's about. And she's like, oh, do you know someone who has asthma? And they're like, you know what? I don't have asthma, but my sister's kid has asthma. And they told me that when they ride the school bus, that that's when they get sicker. Esto me lo han dicho más de mil gentes cuando yo les pido que me firmen que me firmen este, este papel aquí. Ellos me lo han dicho. So she said like the thousands of people that she's talked to um, at the different events, that's what they have told her is that they've already made that connection between asthma and the school buses. Eso es. Okay, that's it. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I think you know, you have several dozen people on this call and more who, who aren't on this call right now um, willing to, to take action to change that um, in, in effective ways. So I, with that, I'll keep the webinar open for a few more minutes just to give people a chance to, to type in the chat. Um, and thank you all so much. And, and look for an email, a follow-up email with questions. We've got a lot of information to organize and send out. Um, there's a thirst for knowledge um, and also the link to this recording that will, that will be made available. Um, so thank you all. And I am super excited for the next steps and to see you again. Have a lovely evening.